think trauma-informed care starts with an understanding of we as human beings adapt to our world. It's not good or bad, it just is. In fact, many of the ways that people adapt to their worlds makes them more resilient. And I think that's a very positive thing. So I think that's a key understanding. The second piece is that um, there are lots of things we can do to support each other and be sensitive to that. Um, I think uh, from an education perspective as adults, when children don't do what we ask them to do, we take it personally as if they were willful towards us. And then we react in a way that's probably not very helpful. I think being trauma-informed means I understand that not always will students act in the way that I want them to, and that they're not always doing that on purpose, that it is a reaction to their environment and how they've adapted and coped through their lives, and that there are things that I can do to help them be calm and to be regulated. I think that schools are you know, kind of a cornerstone of, of the community, and that's what we're learning is that the more we're focused on this work and then partnering with the community, the more this community is starting to change. And so from a school perspective, when children are coming in, you know, if I've got, say, 30 children in my classroom, 20 of them are, you know, in some way impacted by the adversities of their world around them. So when we think about practices that help kids uh, know what's going to happen today, so it's predictable, it's a safe environment, uh, it's a place where I can be calm, and that allows me to be in a space where I can start learning today. I think that's a critical component. So when schools are, are practicing that, helping kids understand themselves and the ways that they can be calm and regulated, and from an education standpoint, when we can help children understand that they're not broken, that their lives might be complicated, but guess what? A lot of lives are complicated. That's also what makes us resilient. That's a very hopeful conversation for people. This is just a condition of being a human being. And the more we know how to support people and help people, the better shot that those people have to graduate and then to go on to those next positive steps to be positive and contributing society members. Uh, at the very basic levels, our, our brains need to be regulated. So if we're not regulated, we're not going to be able to do much other than kind of be in a fight, flight, or freeze uh, mode. So for the brain to work well, it needs to be regulated, and we have to be in relationship with each other. And once those two things are working for people, then we can get to reason, we can get to thinking. And from a teacher's perspective, my really important content that I want my children to remember, at that point, that's when the cortex, the, the remembering part of those knowledge and skills, is sort of open for business. Helping children sort of change their reactive behaviors, what they've been, they've been practicing all their lives so far, uh, we kind of uh, see that as behavior, and I think behavior is communication. They're telling us, things have been complicated for me, this is how I've been practicing. And so when we want to have them change their behaviors, that we need to provide joy with that. The pathways we use the most are like freeways, so they're easy to get on and you can go fast. And that's our quick response. Um, going a different route, that takes some thinking, it takes some planning, it takes energy. And that's the part that's complicated, I think, is that it takes more energy to do that. So if you can't provide joy along with that in some way, uh, the brain says, yeah, that wasn't joyful and it was hard, so why would I go back there? Let's find joy. And when the child gets there and, and makes that self-controlled choice or does the, the thing, the preferred thing we want them to do, whatever that is. If we can provide joy along with that, then the brain wants to come back and do that again until that becomes its own super highway that is easy for the child to do. The big uh, aha in all this is it isn't about doing a lot of big things. It's actually doing little things. Taking time. For example, uh, a child who's had a lot of adversity, their world has not been real predictable. But when we make classrooms safe places that are predictable, and I think that's probably a key thing, that a child walks in the door, it's just like I expect it to be. When it's not like I expect it to be, I get really nervous. And once I'm really nervous, I can go either way pretty quickly. And so when staffs have a very predictable, safe place for kids to come in and learn and get ready to, to go to school, 
I think that makes a big difference. Brain breaks is not an uncommon thing. We hear that now in a lot of classrooms where we're gonna do some instruction, but then we're going to take five minutes and we're gonna do a brain break, which could be a fun activity, it could be something we do independently. A number of things can happen during that time, including music, and so those are different things that are happening too. Also, just being physical, um, literally having time to go out and be physical. So whether it's the walk the track or doing some kind of in our classroom sort of a, a calisthenic kind of a thing or something like that where we're stretching and moving our bodies in a healthy way, but it's very programmed. So rather than recess where we're just running for a free-for-all, which can really ramp kids up and get dysregulated, it's very thoughtful, it's very premeditated, and it's really helpful for the child to help the body regulate. That ability to have self-regulation, you have to teach it. But after a while, when the child's able to do that on his own, then that becomes a skill set to have for the rest of your life. It's a pretty exciting thing. I'd like us to be where we have a highly educated team of you know teachers and support staff, and I'm talking everybody, from custodian to the cafeteria to our bus drivers, everybody's on board with this understanding of the neuroscience, at least at a very basic level, enough that, you know, for example, when my kindergartner is coming from their the house to the bus and is terrified at the bus, so the bus driver really gets that. It isn't just get on the bus, kid. It's oh, I get, you're five, you could be exposed to all kinds of adversities, you might be a quick trigger, what can I do to make this a safe place? Because if it's a safe place and a welcoming place, then getting on the bus isn't such a big deal. And so what do I need to do to make that happen? So those kinds of things, it sounds kind of simple maybe, but at the same time for a five-year-old, that's a game changer for the whole day. That sets the course for a whole day sometimes, and we want everybody to be a part of that journey. So I think when it's pervasive and just normal, that's what I'd like. Adult self-care is, I think, paramount to this work. So inherent in any um, helping profession, education is one of those, nursing is one of those, counseling is one of those. Uh, there's sort of this um, normal adult behavior, which is I need to attend to everybody else's needs first. And I either don't matter or I'm just last. And if I actually don't attend to everybody's needs first and I actually take care of myself, I actually feel guilty about that. So this complex sort of feeds on itself. So doing this for 15, 20 years in education can cause you to kind of move towards a pathway of burnout. If you're moving along that pathway because you haven't been taking care of yourself, then I think you're going to have less ability to grab something new like neuroscience and try to pull that into your practice. So I'm teaching third grade, I've got all the content areas. You want me to teach neuroscience now? That's not gonna happen, right? So that would be just an adult reaction. So adult self-care is, is paramount. How we do that's very critical. It isn't just the principal saying, please take care of yourselves, and we check the box. It's about building a staff culture of we do care for each other. We're building a safe place for us all to come to work. We're collaborative, we're supportive, we're challenging. Professional learning communities are about challenging each other on our, our practices. How do we get better at this? But inside of all that is if I'm not healthy and well as an adult, because I'm attending to everybody's needs, that's just a pathway for burnout, and it's a slow pathway. The most common universal frustration with any of this work is, what can I do? And there isn't one answer. Humankind is a very complicated thing. And so having really tested tools to put in that metaphorical tool belt, I think is probably really critical and give them staff development training on it so that as they're practicing and, and using those tools in a better way that's, that's better for kids, that they're able to then teach their colleagues and, and we just keep those fires burning. I think this is some of the most important work that we're doing right now. And at 28 plus years in education, I wish I would have had this 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I'm excited for this to be in the hands of brand new teachers.